My name is Rich Lyons. I'm the dean of the Haas School here. Uh, we're thrilled and it is a full capacity house here to talk with Donald Knauss, the CEO of Clorox. Uh, Clorox, as you know, is local. We have lots and lots of history, which I want, I want to talk a little bit about with, uh, with this wonderful, wonderful company. Um, its products, right? All of us uh, are using its products so many more times than we even realize. We fill our grocery carts with their products every single day, whether it's uh, Glad bags or Clorox bleach, Formula 409, that list goes on and on. Most all of us know that those are Clorox products. There are an awful lot of products out there that we all use that many of us may not realize are also Clorox products and a very short list here, Burt's Bee personal products, Hidden Valley dressing, Greenworks cleaning supplies, that list also on and on and on. Um, there, there are some other things that you may not know about the company. Let me touch on a few of those. Nearly 90% of Clorox brands hold a number one or number two position in uh, market share position in their categories. That is absolutely extraordinary for any business anywhere, right? Here's another statistic fact that you won't know. Uh, three of the world's top CEOs are both Haas alums and Clorox alums. <laughs> who are they? Um, uh, who are these people? Uh, Joe Jimenez was in February of this year chosen to be Novartis's CEO. He is a Haas alum, MBA alum, spent years at Clorox out of Haas, uh, the two of us as a talent development team, uh, pretty, he's a remarkable guy, a young, you know, roughly 50s, uh, early 50s age, very, very uh, effective leader of Novartis. John Riccatello, Electronic Arts, uh, is a Bachelor of Science, uh, an undergrad alum, 1981. Mike Gallagher, Playtex CEO, former uh, CEO at Playtex, uh, got two degrees from Haas. Uh, so we're very happy about those three. We expect to see many, many more. Uh, it will require that we continue to deliver talent to Clorox, which is part of uh, my job and part of your job as well. Um, the relationship with, between Clorox and the campus is, is much broader and deeper also, as you know, than just uh, connections to the, to the Haas School. Over 100 Cal alums are working at Clorox right now. Dane, uh, Dan Heinrich, for example, their CFO, is, is a Haas grad. We have uh, two of our very own Haas alums here. Uh, Ryan Pintado Vertner, MBA 06, is here. Thank you, Ryan. And also Jeff Edwards, 07 MBA, is here. They're seated here. Uh, a little bit of background on uh, our speaker and the leader of Clorox. 19, or 2006, rather, is when he joined uh, as CEO and chairman of Clorox. Twelve years before that at Coca-Cola Company, uh, where he was president and chief operating officer of Coca-Cola North America. That's, that was 2004 when he took that job. Prior to that, many uh, leading marketing and sales positions with companies you heard of, PepsiCo, Procter & Gamble, really a remarkable uh, trajectory through some incredibly important firms and also very, very effective firms. Um, before entering the corporate wor world, Don Knauss was an officer in the United States Marine Corps, we thank you for your service. He holds a bachelor's degree in history from Indiana University. Uh, a little bit about the company. Uh, he's grown, he and, and the whole organization have grown revenues uh, from 4.6 billion in fiscal year 06 to 5.5 billion fiscal year 2010. That of course includes a period of uh, a lot of market retrenchment in general within the economy. A uh, long-standing commitment to promoting workplace equality, embracing diversity in the working world, and of course within, within Clorox as well. In 2006, uh, Don received the Jackie Robinson Foundation's Roby Award for Industry Achievement uh, as a recognition of his commitment and Clorox's commitment in this area. Uh, Clorox, for those of you who don't know, it is right in our neighborhood, as I mentioned before. It's Oakland, California. It employs 8,300 people now worldwide. And with the global downturn, uh, this is a company that has a 32-year trend of raising its dividend. That also is a remarkable feat. Its products are manufactured in more than two dozen companies, sold in more than 100 countries, uh, sorry, two dozen countries, and sold in more than 100 worldwide. Uh, it's committed to making positive 
and effective difference in the communities where its employees both work and live. Uh, and a lot of that commitment comes from the Clorox family, or Clorox Company Foundation, rather, uh, but it extends beyond just the foundation work. Established in 1980, that foundation is awarded cash awards totaling more than $80 million to nonprofit organizations, to schools, also to colleges. Uh, in 2010 alone, the Clorox Foundation awarded some $3.5 million in cash grants, and Clorox uh, as a company made product donations uh, in, at about the $9 million level, many of them in the same directions. It is with great pleasure that I welcome our friend, neighbor, and leader of Clorox, Don Knaus. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rich. Can you all hear me all right? Can you hear me all right? Good. Well, it's nice to be with all of you. I'm glad that uh, Jeff and Ryan are here. They've, they've got the tough questions planned for me. But I, I thought what I'd talk about, that title of this slide actually is what is on the, title, on the cover of our annual report this year. And the, the key to that performance uh, we think is leadership, and it's probably one of the more overused words. You, we've all heard it so many times, it just, it's lost all its meaning. But I want to give you uh, my point of view about leadership uh, from a business perspective, but really talk about it. it's not only the head side of it, it's the heart side and how we're shaping the culture of Clorox, we think, which is the key to sustaining performance over time. So this is probably the best simple definition I've seen of leadership, and this would span the last 35 years I've been working either in the military or in the business world. But it is at the end of the day, as you all think about your, your own lives post Haas, how do you rally people to a better future? Uh, whatever you're going to do, whether it's uh, staying in business or working in government, or whatever, how do you rally people to a better future? And that's these two components, I think, of leadership where it is the head side, it is thought leadership, it's, it's painting a picture of what you think that future is, that better future. But then the people side of this is so critical now, especially as the global competition for talent becomes so aggressive. How do you retain the best talent and keep them energized, keep them engaged? I want to spend a, a little bit of time on both of those. But on thought leadership, that envisioning of the future for us at Clorox, and of course, I think most consumer packaged goods company, that vision has to be anchored in a core idea. And the idea for us is that we have to have insight, consumer, shopper, user insights against trends that are going on out there. We have to solve people's everyday problems. And in fact, our mission statement is we make everyday life better every day. And people really take that to heart. But it is that we have insights against trends, and I'll show you the trends we're focused on, and then we have to define or win these three stages of what we call demand creation, creating loyalty over time. We want lifetime loyalty on our brands. I think, as, as Rich mentioned, the dean mentioned, 90% of our brands are number one or number two in the space. I think a lot of that's driven by lifetime loyalty. And that's obviously the most effective relationship you can have when people are with you for a lifetime. But I, I think, and our, our team thinks, there are three moments of truth with a consumer in our business. And we classify those desire, decide, and delight. I would describe those really as pre-purchase, point of purchase, and post-purchase marketing. So on desire, for example, uh, how do you create a relationship before they walk into an outlet to buy you? And I'll get into that in more detail in a second. But on the trends, these insights against trends, these are the four trends that we've been focused on the last four years. And our question has always been, how do we make our brands relevant against those trends? Health and wellness, for us, it's about disinfection. It's about killing bad bugs. We kill a lot of bad bugs, and we kill them dead. <laughs> and we're trying to keep you all healthy. Um, there are 100,000 people in this country a year dying from hospital-acquired infections. One of the most effective and cheapest disinfectants in the word, world is sodium hypochlorite bleach. So for us, health and wellness, it's all about disinfecting and how we do that more effectively. Sustainability. It's been a major trend that we've been focused on for four years, maybe even before it became totally popular. But it has led to, for example, the creation of Greenworks as a brand. It led to the acquisition of Burt's Bees. It has led to the repositioning of Brita water filtration systems. So sustainability is core to us. Multicultural, the browning of America, if you will. When I started my career at Procter & Gamble in 1981, there were 10 million Hispanics in this country. Today, there are 50 million. 
if we don't connect with the Hispanics, the African American consumer, the Asian American consumer, we're not going to win over time. So that connection is incredibly important to us. And are we getting insights against those various uh, ethnic groups that, we can, that they can relate to us and we can relate to them? And then, of course, affordability has been a trend that's been obviously topical for a long time, but especially in the last couple of years, it has been brought into very sharp relief that we've got to get very focused on affordability. And I'll go through the other stages of this growth framework, but essentially if there was one page that somebody asked me on the elevator, where is Clorox going to get, it, where is Clorox going to get its growth over the next five, ten years? It's really focused on those trends. I'll explain the 3D innovation. That's this innovation against the marketing, those three moments of truth. Then I'll talk about those top three, which is, to me are the icing on the cake, which is that's where we see some real growth platforms coming in, in addition to our core brands. So on this first one, on, on trends or on the three Ds, desire. As I said, it's all about creating this relationship with a consumer before they walk into an outlet, whether it's a Walmart, a Safeway, you name it. But and that's been a very traditional approach over the years with television, radio, print, that's how you typically connect with consumers, driving these integrated ideas across. This is the approach we take to create this, this pre-purchase relationship, if you will, so they're predisposed to buying our brand when they walk into that outlet. Price value equation, is it right? We know that, for example, with all the analytics we've done on our business, that when our brands have about a 25 to 30 percent price premium versus a private label brand, we can gain share. We start to get outside that band, we start to lose. And that's asking a lot of a brand to pay, to deserve a 25 to 30 percent premium. But we're, we're doing it and we're gaining share doing it. The second is the spending mix that we, we put out there. We spend about 9 to 10 percent, about $500 million a year on marketing, traditional marketing. And I'll show you how that shifted just in the last three years. And then this thought of integrated messaging around a core idea. An idea that not only drives the brand, but that drives the category. Because when I go out and talk to our customers, the Safeways of the world, the Walmarts of the world, um, guess what? They don't care if our brand grows share and our competitor loses share, but the category is flat. So we're selling 100, you know, 100 bottles of disinfecting today, and Clorox has 40 of them. And next year, we've got 45, but it's still 100. The retailers don't care. In fact, they said, you failed. I don't really care if you're gaining share, but the category's not growing. What are you doing as a leader in these categories to expand the pie? So that's what's critical to us around this integrated messaging, is getting an idea that not only unlocks the brand, but uh, expands the pie and makes the pie or that product more relevant to people. So this is the shift in spending. When I walked into Clorox in 2006, about 90% of our half a billion was spent on traditional media, television, radio, print, about 10% on non-traditional social media, for example. Look what's happened in just three years. We've moved several hundred million dollars into non-traditional media. It's not only social media, the Facebooks of the world, et cetera, but more PR. It's also much more focused in-store communicating with people at the point of purchase. So a pretty radical shift, and we see that shift continuing today. Just to give you an example on how that manifests itself, this this approach to desire on one of our brands. Kingsford is one of our brands. Now, this is probably the oldest product we have. It's been around about 40,000 years. Um, people figured this out about 40,000 years ago. We weren't quite there yet. But this is a brand that about 10 or 15 years ago was supposed to be dead. Because about, oh, it was about 1997 or 98, I think, when the company looked at the sales of gas grills versus charcoal grills, and they started to cross. Those lines crossed. He said, oh my God, we've got to milk this business now because it's dead, it's dying. Uh, gas grills are going to take over. But then it, people had a very interesting insight. They said, well, wait a second, let's go ask people which food they prefer when it's prepared on gas versus charcoal. And guess what? The majority of people said, you know what? Food tastes better when it's cooked on charcoal. Oh, there's a thought. Maybe they'd like to continue to have food that tastes better on charcoal. In fact, Maybe they'd like to have it not only from, in this country, Memorial Day to Labor Day, but maybe throughout the year. And so the big idea was, in fact, Kingsford last year grew almost 9%. It's now a $600 million brand just in the United States, a brand that was supposed to be dead. 
And because of that simple insight of food tastes better on charcoal, let's make it not a 13-week business, let's make it a 52-week business, and let's get it around this emotional idea of connecting to your family and slow down and grill. And once we get through Labor Day, I know what we'll do. We'll link it to football, and we'll do tailgate at home. So once Labor Day ended, now we're into college football, we're into high school football, we're into pro football, and now we've got retailers taking their meats, their condiments, and hooking to Kingsford from September through Super Bowl. And all of a sudden now, a 13-week business has become about a 30-week business. And now it keeps growing. And guess what? The other thing that's happened, Latinos tend to barbecue the old-fashioned way. They don't use a lot of gas. They're out in parks. We're connecting with them in parks, for example. So all these different ways of, of connecting, television advertising, advertising, partnerships with NASCAR, we're into barbecue championships with the real experts in this who really love the Kingsford brand. We're online. We're with Facebook. We've got public relations going. There's just a number of touch points to keep this relationship and this idea of slow down and grill front and center with people. And guess what's happened since the recession really kicked in two years ago? People are reevaluating if they're going to go out and eat. They're not eating out as much. And this... And sometimes the simpler things now are more important to people, staying home and having fun with friends and family. So that's really driven that business. And then you think about the side. Let's say we do a very good job of creating this relationship with people. They're predisposed to our brand. We spent a half a billion dollars doing it. Now they walk into the store. If we can't leverage those insights for wins in the store, if we don't really connect with them in the store, then we probably just wasted a half a billion dollars because one of the other things we know in our categories is that over half the purchase decisions are made in the store. How many of you make up a, a shopping list when you go to the store? Anybody do that? A lot of people are doing it more now. Usually what you put on that shopping list is a category description, not a brand. You'll say, I need cat litter. I need soap. I need laundry detergent. But you typically don't put a brand down, even though we've got some great number one brands. We want that decision in the store so we focus on these four fundamentals. If we get these right, we think once you get in the store, we can help you push you to our side, if you will. Is the assortment right on shelf? I was going through uh, our, with our head of MID the other day, Market Intelligence. We have a pretty robust analytics program. It's very interesting. Last year, half of our growth, and we grew 3% in volume, half of our growth came from assortment or new distribution points, getting another facing of Clorox bleach at Walmart, getting another facing of 409, expanding the charcoal set by two feet in Home Depot. It's really just getting it out there, making it available. Is it merchandised? Is it on display? Is the price point right? Is it shelved adequately? So when you walk into that store, if we hit those fundamentals, we got a good chance of winning that sale. And in fact, if you take Hidden Valley Ranch as an, this is an interesting animal. This brand is almost a $400 million brand in the U.S. now. In March of this year, Hidden Valley Ranch was bigger than all of Kraft salad dressings combined, and they compete in five segments. And it's fundamentally because the idea, that idea I talked about, that brand and category idea, the idea that some smart folks we have over there thought about on, on Hidden Valley was, let's not, make, let's not think about this brand as a salad dressing. Let's think about it as a condiment. And last year, ranch dressing was larger than ketchup in supermarkets. Because now people aren't using Hidden Valley Ranch just on salad dressings. Now we've got kids dipping vegetables. We've got kids dipping chicken wings. We've got people dipping, <coughs> dipping uh, frozen pizza. And that's why you'll see, you'll see displays. <laughs> you'll see displays all around the store. In the frozen food aisle, you'll see displays of Hidden Valley Ranch. Because people had this insight of framing the problem, Dean and I were talking earlier about those who frame the problem differently, more comprehensively, are going to get a better solution. They framed the problem or the opportunity very differently. They said, this isn't a salad dressing, it's a condiment, and now it's bigger than ketchup. Heinz folks aren't half thrilled about it, but that's the way it is. And it's now it's, and it's transitioned to a strategy of getting it more around the store than just in one section of the store. And this, this is probably the most interesting to me is delight. So now we've spent a half a billion on desire. We've spent about 700 million on decide. So now we're in for about a billion too. And now you take it home and, we, and the product utterly fails and you are really pissed off. 
And now you get online and you tell 10 of your friends that this has been the worst experience of your life and it goes viral and we are, now we've just wasted a billion too. So deliver, delivering these decisive product wins is really important and this is what we focus on delight. 60-40 wins. The last big consumer research project I was involved with at Coca-Cola North America was figuring out what was the most effective, efficient way to spend marketing dollars. We were spending about a billion dollars on marketing in, at Coke. And we were spending it on about 40 different vehicles, if you will. It was television, it was radio, it was print, it was sports sponsorships, it was stadiums, named to stadiums. We were the official soft drink of NASCAR. All of these things, and we said, you know, which one of these are all, which, how do you prioritize these? Turtile them, if you will. What are the most effective and efficient ways of connecting to consumers? So what do you think, after all this spend and all this reason, what do you think came out as the most effective, efficient way to reach people and form a relationship? Word of mouth. If you tell somebody that you really like Hidden Valley Ranch, you're about 10 times more effective than I am telling them because they trust you and they don't trust me necessarily. So we said, you know what, with that, with that piece of learning, our conclusion, with that finding, our conclusion was, I know what we'll do, we'll focus on superior product performance. So we're going to shift to a 60-40 blind mentality around R&D, which means if I gave you two products in a plain white wrapper, one's Clorox and one's somebody else's, I said, please, take these home for two weeks, use them, and then come back and tell us which one you prefer. We wanted 60 out of the 100 to say it's us. Well, four years ago, four years ago, we had, we were down in here. About 20% of our portfolio had that kind, of, that kind of demonstrable win. And getting that win blind with no brand is really hard. Look where it's come in the, in the last four years. Now we're up to almost half of our brands have that kind of advantage. And that has been, I think, a major uh, contributing factor to our performance, which I'll show you in a second, in the marketplace. The other, the other three things we're focused on we call cost evasion, for example. That's really a combination of cost. How do we do that? This is kind of the holy grail for consumer packaged goods companies. How do you take cost out of a product but improve the performance? So, so guess what some of our scientists out in uh, Pleasanton came up with for Kingsford? They said, you know what? One of the biggest problems with charcoal is people don't like waiting around to get it up to cooking temperature. It takes too long. If we cut grooves into the briquettes, we'll increase the surface area. If there's more surface area, it will light quicker. So instead of, it takes you three beers to write this thing, <laughs> now it's only about a beer. So, and by the way, it took, they, well, we do a lot of work with Budweiser, they're not too thrilled about it, but we took 7% of the weight out of that briquette, saved over $5 million, but enhanced the consumer uh, experience. Every brand in our company has a responsibility for news. No one gets a free pass. And those accelerated growth platforms, the Hispanic platform, the Stop the Spread of Infection, and Natural Products are three other areas that we're focused on within, with delight. And this is, uh, every year we try to get at least two points of growth out of new products. Now, we've had a long-standing top-line objective with Wall Street that we will grow 3 to 5% a year. We're getting about two points consistently out of new products. This is the, this is the trend since 2004. You can see since the recession, it's, it's getting more challenging because what's happening is people are spending more and more money, manufacturers are spending more and more money discounting products. So revenues aren't, volume is growing faster than revenue now, which is the first time that's happened in years. But pretty consistently, our R&D and our marketing organization have delivered against that goal. And so when you, when you get clear focus on the key trends, and we see these trends not only relevant in the U.S., but around the world, about 60% of our international business comes from Latin America, and we see these same trends very relevant there, as well as Australia, New Zealand, et cetera. Getting this 3D innovation, really understanding how you get desire, decide, and delight working in concert together really does create a demand engine that's very effective. And then leveraging it across those three additional opportunities really can create a growth algorithm you can sustain over time. But at the end of the day, it's, it's our people who really make this happen. So I want to spend a few minutes on the culture side of Clorox and the heart side of leadership. 
as you think about your own careers going forward. Those two phrases up there, inverted pyramid and agility, that's really been the themes of our culture for the last few years. And uh, let me build on what that really means for you. These are the Clorox values. They were in place before I got there. And it's an interesting set of values because they're basically each pair is a bit in conflict. So stretch for results and do the right thing. We want people to stretch out for results, but you've got to do it with integrity. Uh, it, it just doesn't work otherwise for us. It doesn't sustain itself. And then take personal ownership, but we are very much a team-oriented culture, work together to win. We try to get the ego out of this as much as we can. But one of the things I thought when I came into the company was, those are great values. But if I'm talking to, to the dean, or I'm talking to my wife who's sitting right here, or I'm talking to Ryan or Jeff, how do I explain to them how to act to bring those values and keep those values alive? What traits would I expect you to focus on? And so I, over the years, I came up with a point of view that these were the five characteristics I'd seen in the military and in business and those four companies I've worked in over 35 years that were the most effective people, not just effective leaders. Started with integrity. You know that thing about, you know, you love that, the, the uh, TV legal dramas when they swear somebody in in the court, tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. That's the attitude we want at Clorox in terms of integrity. Don't game the system. Don't lie to me by omission. Don't advocate a position that you really don't believe in because you want to move something forward. We expect everybody to really do that. Because guess what happens when you create that kind of focus on integrity? You get trust. And trust is the grease of commerce. If I trust you to do something, it's amazing how much quicker you make decisions. If there is no trust, if there's suspicion there, things just get gummed up. So we have a real focus on integrity. Optimism. Uh, when Colin Powell was chairman of the Joint Chiefs, he had a great line on optimism. He said, optimism is a force multiplier. And it really is a force multiplier. But we don't think about optimism as, you know, things are just great. We're all going to sing Kumbaya, and hopefully this is going to get better. Um, we've got some really tough realities in our business right now. The biggest one being, when I came here four years ago, our categories in aggregate were growing 1% to 3%. Now they're declining 1.5%. That's a massive swing. We've got to confront that reality. How do you deal with that reality? But you do it in a sense of, we think we're going to win. Well, there's a prevailing faith that we're going to win this thing together. So there's a positive energy. No one wants to be around negative energy. And there's a positive energy, I think, in the company where we can tackle any problem we got. We'll solve it. But there's a sense that we're going to win this thing. Curiosity, it's all about ideas and insights. They drive organizations. And one of the things I've obviously learned is that world-class leaders are world-class listeners. And how do you get out and really listen and create the routines and the forums in a company to get ideas from all levels of that organization. We've got 8,300 people in Clorox. We've got great ideas across the levels in, that, in our company. It's just having a sense of curiosity and recognizing people who have it. These last two, I think, are the glue that really hold it together. Because we didn't talk a lot about a compassion uh, in our company and any of the other four companies I worked in. Um, but it is the glue, and it's essentially a genuine concern for others. Do you really take care of each other? Is there a genuine respect for the individual as a human being, but also of what they bring to the party here? Um, and do you have genuine concern more for your people than yourself? And uh, this was a, something that, you know, that really started for me when I, when I was in the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps has a great way of beating leadership into your head, whether you like it or not but they kind of do it with a velvet hammer, and they do it with traditions, and that culture is 235 years old. And this, uh, this is an interesting anecdote, at least for me. You'll be the judge of that. But the very first day I was in a line Marine unit, so this was after 15 months of school, because every Marine officer has to go through infantry school, and then I was an artillery officer, so I had four and a half months with the Army. And then finally I go to Hawaii, which is really tough duty. And... Uh, I, was, I, was, uh, I landed in Hawaii, and they said, by the way, Lieutenant, your unit is training on the Big Island. Uh, you need to go over to Hawaii and meet your unit, and uh, we'll fly you over there. And so I get over there, and um, 
they jeeped me out to the firing point. And these guys had been out in the field for weeks. And they hadn't had any hot food in like three days. So the commanding officer of the battery had hot food prepared in the uh, base camp and had it trucked out. So I had met the commanding officer. I met the battery gunnery sergeant, who was the senior enlisted guy. And these enlisted guys, senior enlisted guys, really the glue that holds these organizations together. And uh, so everybody's, they're setting up the food, and uh, I'm hungry. And so I start to go get in the line. And the gunnery sergeant grabs me by the shoulder and says, uh, Lieutenant, in the field, the men always eat first. If there's anything left, you can have some. I said, I got it. It's all about your people. And if you really, if there is a genuine concern for your people, that comes through. And on humility, um, and I think we were talking about this earlier, Rich, about when people recruited Haas, what they like is this competence without arrogance. Um, humility for us is about approachability, accessibility. How do you get these ideas really to the fore? And my experience on this is very interesting to me that as I've moved up in an organization and as I've watched other people move up in organizations, whether it's business or government or academia, it doesn't matter. As you gain more power, the less you use it, the more authority you'll be given. And the difference between authority is the persuasion, to me, the persuasion of persuading someone to do something versus compelling somebody to do something. There's a lot more power in authority than power, if you will. Um, you know, the interesting, th the historical example to me is if you take Martin Luther King, he had virtually no power. He was not a head of state. He was not a CEO. He was not a dean. He, wasn't, he didn't have any formal power. But he had tremendous authority because people believed in his point of view and what he was advocating. I think as you, as you go up in organizations, people know you've got the power. The less you use it, actually, the more powerful you become if you really approach it with a sense of humility. That has led those traits, and now 40% of our people's annual appraisal is based on our assessment of how well they live those traits. So it's not toothless. It is actually in the annual appraisal. And that creates this inverted pyramid, which is I'm on the bottom of that pyramid. And maybe it's an over, overused term, servant leadership, but actually it is very compelling when it's working. And the fact is my job is to provide the resources for my folks to be successful. It's not for them to make me look good. So as the senior team has embraced that feeling of the inverted pyramid, it leads to agility because essentially what the inverted pyramid is to me, it's fundamental respect for people and it is a lack of formality. It's trying to create a more informal institution to really to drive speed in decision making. So clearly there's already, there is a hierarchy, but we have created, I think, routines and forums for people to get their ideas to the surface. So this culture anchored in these values, those leadership traits, we believe is, is starting to really drive a performance-based culture. So the question is, all right, sounds good, is there, where's the proof? So is that vision becoming a reality? That vision of focusing on the, the head, trend-based, 3D-based, and then focusing on the heart, those are the four areas we tend to look at, which are pretty basic. What's the financial performance of the company? Are we gaining share? Or are people not making the decision to buy us? What about our shareholders? Are they getting anything out of this or, or not? And then what about our employees? Are they really engaged? Do they like getting up and coming to work in the morning? Are they getting their career aspirations fulfilled? Well, on the first one, here's what's happened to our fi financial performance over the last few years. Since the recession hit, and this is when it hit, started to hit hard. You can see in the last couple of years, we've got a compounded growth rate of almost 14% on earnings per share through this recession. That performance we would stack up against any company out there, I think, uh, maybe other than Apple. But um, <laughs> we think that's pretty solid performance in categories that aren't quite as exciting as iPads and iPhones. Then let's look at market share. Uh, over the last couple of years, in a deep recession with premium price products, we have gained about a share point. This is all outlet data. What this means on track channels is this is syndicated data that Nielsen or IRI would provide to anybody who wants to buy it. 
That's typically the Safeways of the world, the Kroger's of the world. It's typically the grocery industry. It's only now about a third of our business. Two thirds of our business is in non-track channels, the Walmarts of the world, the Costco's of the world, Sam's, Dollar General, Family Dollar. They don't sell their data to any syndicated data provider. So when you look at all outlets, and we can model that data, we're, we're doing quite well. We're about a 28 share of all of our categories. One of the other interesting things about Clorox is because we compete in such a diverse group of categories, from Kingsford Charcoal to Hidden Valley Ranch to Brita to Burt's Bees, we're about three and a half times the size of our nearest branded competitor. SCJ, SC Johnson, is our nearest branded competitor. If you look at their share of all of our categories, because they don't compete in charcoal and other things, they've got about an eight share to our 28. So we have a lot of scale advantage, even though we're not as big as Procter & Gamble by a long shot. But in our space, we've got a lot of scale. And in a deep recession, we feel very good about the fact that we must be doing something right with consumers and customers if we can gain share in that environment. And then from a total share owner return, and this is a, a compilation of stock price appreciation and dividends, since this goes back 27 months to when it, just before Lehman Brothers collapsed, you can see the S&P 500. This is through, this is the last full month we had through September 30th, negative six. Our peer set, 20, and that includes Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, Kellogg, General Mills, uh, Church & Dwight, the usual suspects. And then you can see where our uh, returns are. So we think our, our shareholder base, and I've been out a lot lately talking to our investors, they're pretty happy. They should be. We seem to be doing pretty well by them. And then, maybe most importantly, the engagement of our people. So what do our people feel? And we, and we think about engagement two ways. It's intent to stay and discretionary effort. Do our people intend to stay with us, or are they on the phone every other day with headhunters trying to find another job? And the discretionary effort, when they get in here, are they really focused on the work and are they really, is the work compelling to them? Do they really enjoy, enjoy it? And you can see in 2007, this when I first got there, it was a real tribute to me that dropped precipitously. <laughs> um, they didn't know what, the, what was going to happen because I was the first one they brought, the first CEO for Clorox in 97 years that had been brought in from the outside. So there was a lot of uncertainty in the company. What, what is this person going to do to us? Uh, and uh, so I think we, we hit that point. And then 2008, you can see it started to build. 2009, now we're up above the benchmark of, of well-performing companies. So I think we feel very good about the fact that we've created a culture um, that we think really engages people and, wants, and, and keeps them engaged over the long period of time. They want to build a career with our company. So at the end of the day, this, this key to leadership is it is rallying people to a better future. I think that the team at Clorox has done a, a very good job of painting a picture of a future based on trends and also doing good in the communities where, where we work, but also creating a culture where people say, you know, I, I believe in those leadership traits. I believe in those values. I want to work in a place that I can be proud of. And that's one of the key things, I think, that is g even gaining more steam over time is that we're seeing the, the newer people coming into our company. Is that becoming more and more important? Can I be proud of this place I work? So I think from a, a, a vision for growth that I can grow with the company and a culture I can feel comfortable in, I think uh, the team has created a pretty good environment. So with that, let me open it up to questions and comments, advice from Ryan or Jeff, and, and we'll push through. Thank you, Don. A hand him to start, if we may. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank and you. we have microphones because we want to capture your voice. So please, uh, questions, but please also mm -hmm. use the microphone if you would. Please, would you use the microphone? Thank you. And any, anybody else want to line up? We'll be ready to go with the next one. Thanks very much for using the microphone. I should have just given you mine. Anybody That'll make it easier. Yeah. Hello, thank you for being here. Uh, you talked about social marketing and general marketing, social media as a focus, and you've increased it from 10 to 40% over the years. Uh, 
how do you see B2B social media play a role in your uh, I'm sorry, how, how would you use what? Business to business social media play a role in your marketing plan. You know, we haven't, I, w I would say probably 95% of our effort, and that's a, a rough guess, is focused on the consumer side of this. I don't think we've pushed it on B2B yet. Because um, I think our approach there has been fairly traditional so far. Um, that's probably something we need to explore more because we haven't, we really haven't delved into that because our, our focus has been so much on the relationship with the consumer and the shopper, we probably haven't pushed that as much. I would say this, um, and this is more of a traditional approach, I, I probably see 20 customers a year. So I'm, I'm trying to get out to see our top 20 customers once a year. Last week I was in Atlanta with Home Depot. Uh, a couple weeks before that I was with uh, Kroger. It's, I think it's, what we're finding from those customers is they keep telling us the same things, if you, regardless of channel, whether it's the grocery channel, the mass channel, the club channel. And I'm, I'm not sure how I can think through how this B2B thing could help us in this, but they tell us three things. One is we want you to grow the categories. So tell us where your insights are in growing our categories because they're all hurting for traffic in their stores. They're really scared about deflation and traffic. The second thing they're saying is, can you use your brands to bring excitement into the store because I need that traffic? And the third thing is take waste out of the supply chains. Take, we gotta keep cutting, cutting waste out. So maybe the way I can think about this as I go back is how can we use the social media aspect to connect back to what they're telling us they need? But thanks for the question. Thank you. We had a second question, thanks. Um, just wondering what your perspective is on the regulatory environment that, that we're facing now and going forward, um, particularly as we're going to your food products. There's an increased emphasis by like Michelle Obama to get healthier foods and things coming into play. How do you, how do you deal with that as a company? And is it something that you relish and you figure we're going we're gonna to figure it out and do it better than anyone else? Or yeah. how, does, how does it affect you? I, you know, I, I think in general, uh, well, I think mean, working in the state of California has its own challenges with regulation versus other states. I'll give you an example. I had, uh, we had a meeting of the uh, uh, Bay Area Council, and George Halverson, who runs Kaiser Permanente here, was talking about what it takes to build a hospital in the state of California based on regulation versus on any other state. Um, from concept to getting patients in the bed, it's seven years in California. It's half that time in any other state. It's not easy with the regulations in this state. To, you know, it's all encompassing almost. It's, uh, but in terms of the, the food side of it, where we see most of the regulation, and we're not big on food other than Hidden Valley Ranch, KC Masterpiece, those are our two big food brands. Our attitude is embrace it and try and do something good with it. Now, I'm on the board of the Grocery Manufacturers uh, Association of America. We have been working with the administration even before the Obama administration on getting uh, labeling right, food labeling right on, on, uh, on food in terms of caloric intake, et cetera, what's healthy, what's not healthy. Um, so I think the industry has tried to say, how do we, how do we approach this thing and, and try and make it a win-win for people? Um, because we want to be transparent with people. Uh, for example, one of the things Clorox did, we were the first company about two years ago to move with full dis ingredient disclosures on our cleaning products other than the fragrances, because there's some proprietary information on, on the fragrances. But we've tried to be really front and center on reaching out and doing that. Another big thing we did, we, we worked with Greenpeace on uh, the transition of our seven bleach plants from bringing chlorine on chlorine gas into those plants to high strength bleach so we could eliminate the security risk around chlorine. We got a lot of kudos from, from uh, Greenpeace for doing that. Um, and from people in general because it would really reduce a, a security risk, a homeland security risk. So we're, we're trying to embrace those changes as best we can, be transparent with people. Uh, we're also trying to push back where we think the regulations, regulatory environment is just getting overly, overly cumbersome. Uh, but as far as food goes and, and things like product safety, I think we've been out, out in front. Hi, given the um, recent sale of the automotive part of the business, are there other categories that you're looking into for future growth that are more in alignment with sort yeah. of the vision of the company? Yeah, that was, you know, we, we, we put our Armor All and STB businesses up for sale. We, we expect to close that deal by the, uh, probably in another two or three weeks. 
it was a business, um, you know, it's a, it's a very high margin business, about a $300 million revenue business, makes about $90 million a year, but we saw no growth in that business. It's probably was the most discretionary piece of our portfolio we had. One thing we learned in that business is when new car sales dropped, so do these categories. People don't, you think, well, people take care of the assets they have. They don't take care of old cars. They take care of new cars. I guess it's kind of like shining new shoes more than you shine old shoes. You just throw the old ones in the back of the closet. <laughs> so we wanted to get out of, that, out of that business. Our priority on acquisition going forward, we really have three. One is we see an explosion in healthcare in terms of disinfecting. Today, there is a billion dollars spent in hospitals on disinfecting hard surfaces, cleaning the patient's room, et cetera. Only 30 million of that billion, 3% is bleach. But the EPA just came out and said the only thing effective against killing some of these pathogens that create all these hospital infections like C. diff spores is bleach. Now, there have been issues with working with bleach over years, the odor. I mean, it's great for 10 minutes in the laundry room twice a week. You like that smell of bleach. At least I do. I'm a little sick that way, I guess. But, <laughs> so, um, but if you work around at eight hours a day in a hospital cleaning people's rooms, it can get overpowering. So we think we're on the cusp of creating an odorless bleach, for example. But our priority, because it's such a huge opportunity, we just bought a small company in Michigan called Caltech which had the number one bleach uh, sprays for hospitals. We had the number one bleach wipes. We think there's a real opportunity to roll up that industry over time. There are a number of mom and pop uh, companies that have been created that work with hospitals, it's incredibly fragmented, who don't have the resources to really drive this thing forward. So we think there's a real opportunity to build a healthcare business that could really have explosive growth for us and do some good things while trying to kick keep these infections down. So that's priority number one is this whole area of hospital acquired infection, uh, nursing homes, daycare centers, you name it. That's number one. Number two would be international. We continue to look at getting more exposure to emerging markets. Southeast Asia and China would be the top priorities right now. We've been in discussions with uh, companies who have what we would consider orphan brands. For example, Sarah Lee, who's selling off their entire home care uh, division, has the number one bleach in Australia. That's not strategic for them, it's strategic for us. Um, so we're, we're looking at uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, China uh, as, a, as a clear opportunity, and also looking in Latin America where our core business is, are there bolt-on acquisitions we could put into our core categories in Latin America? That would be the second priority. That's hot and heavy now. The third priority would be natural personal care. Um, Burt's Bees, uh, when we bought, I think most of you are probably familiar with Burt's Bees, an amazing brand. Uh, it's about a $200 million business in this country. When we acquired it two and a half years ago, we were in, it was in five countries. By the end of this year, we'll be in 36 countries. So we're really starting to ex explode it out. That's a category that's growing in the high single digits. It's probably the fastest growing category we play in. So we're looking for other brands in that space that we could bolt onto that. So first priority is the hospital healthcare disinfecting space. The second is international emerging market exposure. The third is natural. Hi. Um, as you had mentioned before, with the U.S. recession, you saw a change in consumer behavior, um, which may have attributed to some of the growth in the recent years. As the recession hopefully mm -hmm. slows down um, or stops, how do you see those trends changing, and how does Clorox, um, how do you plan on reacting as people may start going to restaurants more, and how do you continue to drive that growth? Yeah. We, th we think... Uh we think we're in this for about another two to four years. We don't think we're going to see a lot of explosive category growth. Or, and we don't think this new age of frugality is going to, uh, people are not going to wean themselves off that anytime soon. I think people, you know, when you think about it, as we've looked at the, the economy in general, there are three basic stools to a consumer's, comp th three legs on a stool of consumer's confidence. Their, their home equity if they own a home, their 401k and their job. And this is the first recession, certainly in my lifetime, where all three of those have been battered. So until all three of those start to improve somewhat and those legs strengthen on the stool, I don't think we're going to see us coming out of this with, with any great speed. So we're, we're planning on, hey, this is tough. It's going to be tough for the next two to three years. We do think the growth for us comes from those, those three platforms I had at the ch top of that chart, if you will. The Hispanic Latino focus for us uh, is, is really huge. And part of that's because 
We've been in Latin America so long, the equity of our brands is really strong with Latinos. Two-thirds of the Latinos in this country are of Mexican origin. So we, we continue to really have a robust relationship there. We think that's a key source of growth, and we, haven't, we, just, we have fairly modest shares there. The second is this whole stop the spread of infection. We think that trend is robust and only getting worse. I think H1N1 last year, and I don't know how badly it hit the Cal campus, but H1N1 scared the hell out of people. And in terms of keeping their personal environment disinfected and safe, and we've seen big changes in household penetration on some of our products like Clorox disinfecting wipes, for example. We thought we were going to have this huge trough. You know, in September last year, or in the first quarter of last year, uh, we grew our wipes business 33%. This category is growing 2%. 33% growth. And we said, oh my God, how are we ever going to lap that? <laughs> it looks like we're going to lap it with positive growth again this year on top of that because people came into this category because all of a sudden it was very relevant and they're bringing those habits with them. So I think the, the multicultural focus, the stop the spread of infection focus, and the natural focus, we see those things coming back. We think we're pretty well poised. So that's, we're going to stay on where our, game, our game plan. We think there's enough growth there to stay on it. We just got to make real sure we don't screw up and get our price points out of whack. And this will be the last question, please. Hi. I'm really interested in the Greenworks line, and I yeah. wanted to know on the market side whether you've seen cannibalization of some of your other brands like 409 or whether you see it as uh, a growth in the pie. Right. And then also internally, whether you've learned any lessons from Greenworks that you've been able to apply to um, brands in a similar category, or whether there's been sort of any spread from, from the lessons in that brand. Yeah, Greenworks is an interesting phenomenon. The first, we launched it in December of 07. The first year, it hit $100 million in sales, one of the best new products in many years. You don't get too many $100 million ideas. The recession cut it in half. So we've seen these categories really get whacked uh, because it had about a 20% price premium, a 20 to 25% price premium versus traditional cleaners. We did see it about 90% incremental. It didn't cannibalize our existing cleaners at all. In fact, we had data from you know, Safeway, for example, where they have their shopper card loyalty cards, where people who bought Greenworks, it was the first time in six months they'd gone down that aisle in Safeway. They just didn't go down the cleaning aisle because they wouldn't buy traditional cleaners. There are about 20% of the uh, households in this country, we call them chemically challenged moms. <laughs> they won't buy anything that has a traditional chemical to it. They want either use baking soda, vinegar, or something that's naturally based like Greenworks, which is corn and lemon and coconut based. Uh, so it was hugely incremental. Our price points were too high when the recession hit. We're now back to about a 6 to 8% premium versus traditional cleaner. So we're really ratcheting back that. Uh, and that's one of the things we've learned is if we can offer people a natural cleaner at a 5 to 10% premium, even in a recession, we're starting to see it come back now. So that's one of the key learnings. The other learning is uh, we didn't deploy any capital to do that. We did it with a co-packer. Um, and thank God we did because we didn't sink a lot of capital. And when this thing got whacked, it, we, didn't, we didn't have to write anything off. So I think we learned that when you've got these new ideas that are fairly revolutionary in terms of the scale we did it with, it's... Uh, Manage your capital very carefully. Watch your price points. The other thing we did on it, we learned on that business is we did a partnership with the Sierra Club. And the endorsement of the Sierra Club for Greenworks and working with Carl Pope and the Sierra Club really did mean a lot to people. And in fact, that, started, that partnership may now broaden out to br working with us on Brita and getting safe water for people. Um, so those are some of the learnings. But it was a brand that is largely incremental to what we do. John Kanowski, thank you very, very much. Thanks, folks.